Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into glute. Before we get into the interview, I want to properly introduce my friend Corey. Corey is a registered nurse and health and nutrition coach. She's been bodybuilding for almost a decade and won the overall at Junior USA's in 2021 while gaining her pro card. Corey received second place in her pro debut and then went on to place top five in several pro shows that same year. Corey coaches competitors and lifestyle clients and also offers posing for her competitors. Corey is passionate about female athletes and being able to educate, which is why she is the perfect person to talk shop on all things glutes. Let's dive in. Corey, I am so happy to have you on the podcast today, and I would like to set the stage for the listeners to really get an understanding of you as you made your way through the MPC rankings and now as an IFBB bikini pro. Fill us in on what your glute training looked like as an amateur um, trying to grow your glutes to perform better on the national stage. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Alex. I appreciate you having me on. Um, So as an amateur bikini competitor, um, I think I fell into the trap that a lot of us do where we're looking at what top athletes are doing, um, you know, kind of pulling from, you know, exercises we see online, seeing uh, different splits and, you know, saying, okay, well, this is how people are succeeding. I'm going to mimic something similar. So that is essentially what I did. I mean, um, when I started competing, for listeners who don't know, I started late 2014, did my first show 2015. I was actually in the teen division. So I was was young. I was very under-muscled at the time. Um, Still arguably am, considering the evolution of the sport. Um, When I got into that, that first realm, I mean, like my training was heavy, heavy glute bias, everything, which I would say now it still is in a lot of ways. But the biggest difference was I I was avoiding, um, a lot of, a lot of squats, uh, a lot of vertically loaded movements, um, even RDLs, deadlifts, like I really was just doing hip thrusts. Like I was focusing a lot on the isolation work and, I think there is that conception that <clears throat> in order to build glutes, I mean, like you need a high degree of stimulus, which yes, like you, you were going to see, you're going to yield, um, you're going to yield hypertrophy, um, assuming that you are eating in a surplus and you're doing it at least correct enough for that amount of time. So, I mean, like I was able to make progress those early years in my training. Um, but looking back, compared to how I'm training now, I mean, like the volume was just ridiculous. And really, I would say um, the biggest blind spot was the intensity. I mean, I was very much chasing that pump. And on top of that, like rather than going in and saying, okay, I'm doing a specific number of working sets per workout or per week, uh, the specific glutes, yes, but also just lower body in general. Um, I was really going in to every workout and like, okay, I'm going to do as much as I can for this duration of time. Um, which I mean, we both know there, there are a lot of people still doing it that way. I mean, because, um, in absence of accuracy, I mean, high volume, excessive volume, it, it will yield results, but really when I reflect back, I mean, like the amount of progress I made over several years, it, it wasn't significant relative to how much volume I was actually doing. Could you give a reference of maybe common rep ranges or your guesstimate of how many sets you were performing at the time? Gosh. Yeah. I mean, like I, I really wasn't working under like 15 reps, even like on hip thrust, hip thrust. That was my primary compound movement. At the time, I think I was doing, gosh, I think I was doing like, uh, I mean, early, early years, I was doing it like four times a week. Wow. Um, And it it was just very, very sporadic. But I mean, like, 
it really was the sets that caught up to me specific to hip thrust. I mean, there were times I was doing like five, six, seven sets. I'm like, okay, I'm getting a good pump. Um, and I think like even going into the national shows that I was doing, um, so this would be 2020, 2021, um, you know, the focus was primarily on hip thrust and then uh, a lot of, a lot of kickbacks, a lot of, what were the other, uh, the abduction machine. So, I mean, like those were the three, like three main movements that I was, I was putting a lot of that volume to, um, I mean, I was in the gym, like 90 minutes minimum, uh, many, many times, two hours. And I wasn't taking rest periods in between like any unilateral work. The unilateral work was, uh, very, very sparing. Um, gosh, yeah, work, working sets. And I mean, like I use that term lightly because the intensity was just lacking. I mean, it really was by our definition, it was, it was junk. Like, I mean, like I was hitting an RIR of like maybe five, maybe, um, really the turning point for me was when I started working with John Jewett. Um, I turned pro in 2021 and, you know, I re I, at the time I was working with a coach who, I mean, like, you know, to his credit, like his focus was getting me my pro card. Our, our strategy was like, okay, your shape is there. You have the structure that really you can compensate enough for the lack of muscularity that you have in your lower body. And, and that's what we did. But I mean, like that coach, he was, uh, he was very insistent. I was doing everything correctly. Don't change anything. I mean, he told me that time and time again, he's like, shoulders look great. Glutes look great. We just need to bring body fat down. Cool. Okay. But, uh, if listeners know, if they followed my journey, I, I suffered a really serious injury that season. And I do attribute that to, yes, like being in a dieted down state, but also I was doing so much volume. Like there was no way I was recovering from it. Um, those workouts, 2021 leading into my pro debut. I mean, like I, I, I got it. I looking back, I mean like 25 really low quality sets per workout yeah. multiple times a week like every, every other day. So like, if we even want to call that a training split, it was just excessive. So when I worked with John, I, I outsourced him, um, blood work. Yes. But like, I was also like, Hey, I, the training is the area I know I'm not maximizing. And like 2021, I'm trying to think who was Miss Olympia then, um, it was it Janet or Jen? It was one of, one of them. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at their glutes. I'm like, I'm not even close. Like I'm having to push so hard in my back pose to compensate for that. I'm also having to get ridiculously lean to even get like that, that very end of the tie in to come through. Um, and when I started working with John, he's like, okay, we're going to bring the volume down a lot. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on some unilateral movements. We're going to still keep hip thrust in. That's going to be your A1. So the movement that we're starting our workouts with, but, um, we're really going to focus on the intensity. So I worked with him as my my coach for training. He was doing my programming, uh, looking at my videos week to week, and really the thing. And it, it didn't, it didn't click. It didn't click for me at first. I mean, but the intensity. I mean, like we worked that for several weeks. Where he's like, okay, this is good. This is harder than you were lifting. You're still far, far away from where I need you to be. Um, but having a coach, having an individual like who, you know, John is, yes, he's an expert in our field, very, very strong, uh, very successful competitor. He was able to train my eye to see that like that intensity, it's just not sufficient. And if you increase that intensity, a much lower volume will actually be more effective and it's going to yield a better outcome uh, in terms of hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The <clears throat> ability to get to an actual intensity level is not a, okay, I, I'm training this way today and then tomorrow it just is a switch flip like it really is a progression of understanding because you're going against what your your brain is telling you to do because your brain is giving you feedback of like ah this is good like we don't need to push any more past this this is almost painful or this is burning or whatever the case may be and then being able to really push past that point and stay under control and work through exercises um, is a, is a real skill and there's a lot of people who are trying to make the body composition change changes that they want and that have not uh, developed that skill. And they're very frustrated within their results that they're not seeing. And this is the one big marker that, um, 
so many people need to train. So what was the thing, what caused this to click for you? Was it just time or was there something that happened that allowed for you to uh, get in sync more? Honestly, what it was, was having an objective measure for intensity, which was that deceleration, the final reps. So uh, this is something that I, I encourage clients to do, especially clients who don't have that skill of uh, repeated intensity filming each of your working sets. So, and if you want to start with your warm up sets, by all means, that's what worked for me. Like, I mean, I, yes, I had the glute drive in the apartment, so, you know, constraints there with filming, but I was like, okay, set one, two, like my warm up sets going into my working, I'm going to see, am I in the active range of motion? Um, once I'm in my working sets, did I stop when I actually was at a, a true failure, or in this case, we were aiming for an RIR of one, so it's not failure. We don't want that complete halt in rep speed, which I think oftentimes if a client or if an individual, um, they didn't play sports, maybe they don't have the experience of feeling what failure is, like actually moving in the opposite direction that we want to move uh, with the bar or on a machine. We're not, we're not trying to achieve that, but we're trying to achieve just shy of that. So those final one to two reps, we should see a drop off in rep speed of like 50%. And, you know, sure, we can get like very nuanced with like, okay, it needs to be this slow or it needs to be this sticky. And it's like for the untrained athlete or the athlete who maybe is still working on honing in that skill, we want to see a significant deceleration. Um, so for me, filming, watching back between my working sets, like you know, on my phone, I'm like, okay, you know what? I, I think like there was another rep there. So for this next working set, uh, if I hit, let's say 10, 10, okay, this next one, I'm going to go for 11 or 12. Like I'm going to add at least one more rep to that series, assuming that I'm still upholding form and there are no changes, which obviously there are because it's being, becoming more fatigued. And if you're increasing the reps, uh, like in a working set of three working sets, if you're going like 10, 12, 15, mm, that that's okay. It might be good. It's just not great. That's not what we were aiming for, but we're getting warmer. We're getting closer, assuming that those that second and third set are closer to that RAR of one. But now you kind of use that for your next lift. You're like, okay, at that weight, that first working set, um, if that was like your Monday, you're going in doing like, let's say hip thrust Wednesday, Friday. Now, you know, unless there was a significant uh, change in recovery, you can probably do working set one to 15. That's probably what we should be aiming for. Uh, and then from there, auto-regulating at least, um, at least uh, in some capacity, but you shouldn't be far off from that. Right. And, and I would add that you're paying attention to the any form breakdown, especially within movements like an RDL or a lunge where we have a lot of moving parts. I would encourage that as we push towards the uh, level of failure that we're not, we, we want to see the deceleration, but we're not seeing a large breakdown in form. There's kind of a window that I generally will recommend to clients of if we're within 80 to 90% of what that first perfect rep looked like, then we're continuing to push on. As we get out of that 20% you know, window, it's probably time time for us to cap off the set because as we start to move our body in a different way, just to move the load, that's not what our intent is when we're looking at improving body composition. If I was in a competition to move the most weight in the lunge and I had, you know, people beside me and there was no markers, I just had to go from point A to point B, then this would be, you know, part of our destiny or goal that we're trying to accomplish. But in the setting of tr changing body composition for the better, um, we want to avoid that because if we're just putting ourselves at higher risk of injury, as well as not really moving more towards the goal, probably just adding overall systemic fatigue and beating ourselves up more for the next set that we'd be performing. Absolutely. I think that's a really key point for listeners. Then like, for instance, right now, like I'm doing front squats. Those are my starting movements uh, for two of the three lower body workouts I do. Um, I know that if I'm ending a set where I'm seeing some of some concaves and my knees coming in, uh, you know, the intensity might be there, but from a quality control standpoint, that's not what we want. So going into the preceding sets, I might stop at rep, let's say seven, even if maybe I hit nine or 10 on working set one, knowing that, okay, th those last few reps, if I can't uphold that form, the quality is not there. It's not really yielding the result that we're aiming for. 
Yeah, absolutely. So this takes us perfectly into what you're doing now as you transition from your first season as a pro bikini athlete and now moving into growing to be at the top level into the next season that you have. How is your training different or or, or what are you doing specifically within your training now? Yeah, no. So right now, um, my starting movements, I mean, like I've really shifted the way, uh, the way I'm structuring those workouts. So, um, two of my workouts in the phase I'm in start with front squats. Um, they, they start with front squats, but prior to that, I'm doing some movements that essentially are priming me for front squats. So prior to going into barbell front squats, uh, I'm doing a B stance RDL. Um, one of those days it's with dumbbell and this is, uh, contralaterally loaded. And so, I mean, like I'm really priming, uh, I, w- I would say, I think a lot of people, they will perceive that as like, oh, it's an activation movement, you know, to turn on your glutes. And really it's not just limited to the glutes. I mean, like you doing any kind of barbell work, um, you want to ensure that, um, you're moving systematically top to bottom. And I mean, you know, find that the B stance RDLs, the constraints of doing those contralaterally loaded. I mean, they're putting me in a better position. Um, also encouraging a lot of pelvic stability, which I mean, like you lose that you're not going to be in a good position to re- recruit the glutes under heavy load. So, um, outside of front squats, uh, just a, a bilaterally uh, loaded RDL. I, I do prefer dumbbells there. Um, but you know, there was a few phases I went through where, you know, I incorporated some barbell work, uh, just the movement pattern. I feel like dumbbells, I'm able to keep things just a little bit closer, um, just to my body. Um, I big fan in this phase, <clears throat> big fan of the landmine RDL. I feel okay. like that opposed to if landmine RDL still B stand, still contralaterally loaded. So we're getting a little bit of glute meat activation there as well. Um, yeah, I I've been a big fan of that hip thrust. Uh, to be honest, this phase that I've been out for three, four weeks, I'm not finding a lot of success with the hip thrust, to be honest. I have tried moving it around in my programming. Um, but frankly, I, I and it's, it, this isn't to demonize it. I, I think, it, I think in my experience, I've done a lot of hip thrust. I've probably done plenty of hip thrust, uh, across my, my training career. Um, but I'm finding that like the results I'm after right now, I mean, like with a hip thrust, the amount of load that I'm needing to use, um, while still maintaining really good stability. It, it's not resulting in, mm-hmm. um, in what I'm hoping for. And I'm finding that, um, you know, there are, there are movements that allow me to get a little bit more bang for my buck. Um, so RDL squat, uh, front squats or a squat modality, um, the unilateral, unilateral split squats, big fan of that. And I've been doing those for about a year and a half. So it's typically, uh, third or fourth down the line. Um, but again, contralaterally loaded. So that in itself is doing a lot of the work that previously I was aiming for through like a cable abduction or machine abduction. And it's not to say that I don't do those, those still have their place. And I mean, I think we, um, can agree like with bikini, the look that we're trying to achieve is, is very imbalanced. Uh, you know, when you look glutes compared to quad or hamstring development, but, um, prior to, prior to this training, I don't know, shift in the last two years, I was doing so many sets on a, just an abduction machine or, or on a cable, uh, cable abduction. Whereas now I am limiting that to really like three sets per workout. Um, and it's towards the tail end, just given that it is, um, very supported and there, there's not, uh, a lot of, lot of risk for injury in that setting. So to give the listeners a little bit of insight here, uh, Corey is utilizing the the contralaterally loaded movements, which is just the dumbbell being held or cable. However, she's performing it in the opposite hand of whatever leg she is training. So if she's in the B stance and the left leg is forward, she's holding the dumbbell or the cable with the right hand. Um, as the shelf of the glute is probably the most, eh, the glute in general is the most important part of bikini, but the shelf is commonly the thing that people are, are struggling with 
the most. And that is in part to, there's not a lot of great exercises for us to select to better target the upper division of the glute max and then part of that glute med. But what we have seen recently, at least, I've seen it be a little bit more popularized, is that with the contralaterally loaded, we're putting a better stress or a greater stress on the glute med and upper glute max to see that development um, and, and be challenged more in what would end up being more of a mid-range or lengthened position. And I would say that that's in part to why the hip thrust hasn't been the most overall successful for you is that you've had such great work within the lengthened bias work very early on in your session and then trying to get to the the hip thrust and get fully shortened and, and have that stability. It's just going to be not a whole lot of bang for your buck in terms of the hypertrophy that you're trying to gain. And then also very time demanding for you to load up, whether it be the glute drive or a barbell um, to get set up and so on and so forth. So I'm glad that all that has been uh, working well for you. I think the last time that we had talked, you were utilizing a leg press. Am I misremembering that? No, 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 no. You're correct. Um, so that typically comes after the front foot elevated, contralaterally loaded split squat, which now I'm actually at the point where I'm just on the split squat because I'll round out there. Um, the load I'm using, like I'm using a 70 pound dumbbell. Um, so there's some decision making around like, okay, do we want to just keep progressing the weight? Um, because I'm hitting, you know, between 10 to 15 reps, depending on recovery. I mean, that in itself, it's kind of on the upper end of the rep range I want to work within for split squats. Um, so now what I'm doing, it's actually the gym I just started training at. Um, they have in like the, the free weight section, almost this like drop down. It's very subtle, but it's maybe like an inch or two. So now I've increased the range of motion for the split squat. So it's still front foot elevated, but now the back leg is um, in a, a greater deficit, allowing me another inch or two. So rather than putting like um, I, I don't even know what they're called. The one in those little like flat, like uh, flat step up boxes. Like again, they're like two and a half, three inches rather than using something like that. Um, I just have it kind of built in. So a little less setup, but for individuals who let's say are progressing well in the split squat, um, front foot elevated split squat, um, there are ways to continue to intensify that movement without necessarily or without exclusively increasing load. Um, but following that, yes, leg press. Um, oh, I'm very fortunate this gym I'm at. I mean, like we, we have several types of leg presses, um, 45 degree linear leg press. I mean, like I, I think, um, that's the one that most people are going to, uh, readily have access to hopefully. Um, but I do find that a hip press or a press that allows for like the actual strength curve, um, to, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong here, um, allows a lot of the weight, um, to, um, to be loaded at the beginning of the movement when you are in that lengthened position. I found that to be really helpful. And previously the gyms I was training at, I mean, we had two types of hip presses like that. Um, again, like again, really getting into, uh, what's going to work well for the individual's structure. Um, but for me, I've seen a lot of success with that, but nothing, nothing, nothing wild with like a super wide stance or super high on the plate. Um, I tend to go neutral stance, tend to go like, I mean, just slightly, slightly wider than shoulder width apart, um, middle of the plate. I feel like, especially when we're talking about something bilateral, um, if output, if you know, I guess power is our, I shouldn't say power, if we're trying to go for maximal load there, um, I think that's a, a favorable setup depending on the individual, individual structure. Um, I think for me, that's uh, been very, very helpful. The uh, the hip drives are fantastic. Uh, there's really two brands that are going to be the most popular. You have the Hammer Strength, and then you also have the Pendulum. I, sorry, we have three. So we have the, the Hammer Strength and Pendulum, which are pretty... Uh, or Rogers would technically be the pendulum. And that one, both of those are fine. Uh, the, the challenge there is going to be how much of a 
strong drop off there is. So it's really, really biased towards that position where your leg will be closest to your chest. So it's really biased there. And then it has a bigger drop off. My favorite of those is going to be from Atlantis. Atlantis has a unilateral uh, option and it's still very biased towards the lengthened position or when your leg is closest to your chest, uh, but is just a, a little bit more balanced overall. And it is a gem of a piece of equipment. And I find that with the leg press or the, the hip press that you're speaking to, it's much easier to take a set to failure in that because you have all the security of if you were to get to the absolute last moment and have to bail on it, it's still going to be caught by the safeties and you're you're good to go. So utilizing the hip drive is fantastic or the, the hip press. And then for the 45 uh, degree angle leg press that's linear and, and moving on the, the rails, uh, it can be used well. There are some that are just not built very well. So you have to be mindful of that. Um, it, I, for the listeners, what I would encourage if you're utilizing that 45 degree is that you are paying attention to your shin angle of when you're at the bottom. If we're more at like a, a, a horizontal shin angle and you're not having elevation to that shin, you're in a pretty good spot and you're not having any rotation to your pelvis. Those would be the things that you're trying to pay the most attention to. If you're trying to bias more glutes, um, yeah, that would be the the gist on that side. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. For you should you. lift heavy. High reps, carbs low are needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats are great. You for should your squat ass to grass. It's fine. It fits my macros. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. My next question for you is that if we were to put this into a tier list of exercises pertaining to glutes, let's say that we pick for tier one, we have our favorite three. Like if we could only do three exercises for glutes, these are the three. And then if we go into tier two and the three that we just said for tier one are gone, what do we pick? And then we'll get, do the same for tier three. Oh, oh, great question. And I'm interested to see if you remember my answer last time, because I, I don't know. I don't okay. remember what it was. I'm pretty sure it's still the same. Um, RDL. Uh, I mean, like, like I said, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. It's highly loadable. So, I mean, it's going to offer um, the highest loadability. Um, and even if we're doing that in a B stance fashion, contralaterally loading, uh, digging more into the glute med, which we're seeing that trend with the evolution of the division where glute med, I mean, they say they don't want them boxed out. Like, I, I don't know, these, these glute meds look pretty boxy to me. So uh, also the highest potential stimulus for target muscle, which is our glutes. So, I mean, like uh, second to that still within our tier one uh, would be a squat modality. So, I mean, like for me, like I personally like the front squats because it's the variation that I can do that allows me to move without any pain. It's also going to give me the greatest range of motion, um, which like structurally, like I have very long Long femurs. My, my torso is very compact. Um, so again, maintaining that pelvic stability. Um, I, I find that a front squat allows me to do that better and overcome those constraints that even with a back squat, I mean, my center of mass, uh, the front squat is just, it's just a better fit for me. It's still squat modality, but if we're moving into then uh, unilateral squats, I mean, the front foot elevated split squat, big fan of that. And I would say that in itself, um, it would be my my third pick for our tier one. Um, it still falls with un, under that umbrella of squat modality, but allows you to be a little bit more specified with the target muscle. Okay. So for the, the listeners, I will add for Corey speaking to front squats, she's going to be in probably a smaller camp that this is going to fit best for glutes. For a majority of people in the front squat, we're going to see a very strong forward knee drive and staying more upright within their upper body. Now I've watched Corey perform this particular exercise and she somehow is able to keep a pretty vertical 
shin angle and she's upright, but she's also almost balanced. It's very interesting to watch. Like, from a structural perspective, you are uncommon in performing this particular exercise. I just want the listeners look, to know. I look like a grasshopper, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very goofy uh, mechanical build, but sorry, go on. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just saying, for major- a majority of people, the front squat is going to be much more quad biased, whereas the a hip dominant squat where we're able to push the hips back and stay more vertical through the shins is probably going to work if we're going to use the back squat uh, or a squat like a squat with a barbell specifically. So just be mindful of that as you're listening through this. Corey's glutes look amazing. She is a bikini pro, but understand that there's specificity within her program design and there certainly should be specificity within yours as well. Um, So we've got the top three exercises being the RDL, the front squat, and then the front foot elevated split squat. Now we move into tier two. What falls into that category if you cannot do any of those three? Okay, so I'm going to say I do I do really like that dumbbell step up, the contralaterally loaded step up. Um, I've seen you, you guys have done several demos of variations of this, but uh, depending on the individual's goal, if it's something that you are intentionally trying to, to increase the load, um, and your stability in you know, stepping up onto a box is strong. I would say, like you know, maybe there's time and place for that where you're not supported. So the let's see, the non-loaded hand, maybe you're doing it in like a squat rack or near something that you can use not to pull yourself up. It's a very big asterisk right there, but to use uh, to use that as a brace, um, I think there's intention or there, there should be intention whether you're using a brace or not, or some kind of support. Um, I, in this phase that I'm in, I have been doing them in a squat rack. So using that beam, uh, just for balance so that I can load the movement, go a little heavier. Um, I do think past that, um, gosh, I'm, I'm going to say kickback. Um, but again, like really emphasizing that the working leg is not externally rotating and drifting up. Um, so, I mean, like that's really going to depend on um, where that is in, in the workout. Uh, I have access to a, a standing kickback that offers, um, like, I mean, I think, I think it's like, I'll forget the brand, um, like a, a life fitness, something, something like that. But basically there, there is a brace for your core. So, um, you're encouraged to not have that, uh, lower back extension. You're not really going to get high degree of anterior pelvic tilt. So that's important because we see, um, gosh, what are Alex help me out? What are the <laughs> ones that like <laughs> the multi-purpose universal kickback machines that are also an abduction and an adduction <laughs> machine? Those I, I'm, I'm not a f- and for the most part, for most people, I, I, I feel like it's just very confusing and is uh, going to encourage. Um, I'm trying to think of what you'd be talking about. It may be a multi-hip. The multi-hip is one where you would yes. have to be, you have to know exactly what you're doing. Like there's, you've got to have some teaching. It's not something you're going to just jump into and have the best execution because you can move your body quite easily to move significantly more load than what you're trying to accomplish by either, you know, training your glutes or training your hip flexor, whatever the positioning of the pad is, uh, you can cheat that exercise quite a bit or that machine. Absolutely. So, I mean, like, again, when I say machine kickback, it's really dependent. Like, I mean, I, do we agree that a hoist kickback is, I don't know if I've seen one favorable. I'm not sure I've seen one. I really like (laughs) I really like the uh, just general, you know, cable because that's a majority from a programming yeah. standpoint, being able to set up well for just a cable kickback with some level of support, whether it be more glute med focused or it be more glute max focused, being able to have the pelvic stability that you talked about, I think is the the biggest kicker. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, please, please, if you yourself, but also listeners go Google a hoist kickback machine, it's like a little kitty ride. I mean, like the whole <laughs> machine moves as you're kicking back. There's no uh, lumbar support whatsoever. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, very confusing. Um, cable kickback, big, big fan there. And more specifically one that is going to allow you to, like, I personally like to have both, uh, both arms, um, supported braced in some capacity. That way we're really focusing on that working leg, uh, being able to, to move, move the weight. Um, 
Okay. And then we get into shortened position, which it's going to be, um, the 45 degree, like what you would see is like a lower back extension, but something that is going to allow you to make that a, a glute extension, um, some kind of raise there. And I think with that, I mean, like for me, that's actually been my second movement prior to front squats. So, I mean, like two sets, I'm not loading it, which a lot of people, I think they, they tend to overshoot with what their needs are in terms of the load. Um, but I think that's going to be superior than something like a hip thrust if we're talking about shortened position. Yeah. I would I would pick the 45, a well-executed 45 over a hip thrust. The challenge that becomes with a 45 is that a majority of the 45-degree hip extensions that people have at their gym are just far too big. Uh, there are a couple of brands that do it a phenomenal job of building ones that are meant for actual size humans, hammer strength. And I want to say hammer strength and life fitness. The ones of theirs are made for like six foot and taller humans. So it cuts out a large audience of the people who are trying to use them for glutes. Um, the brands that I do like that come off the top of my head, Nautilus, they have one that actually adjusts from 30 degrees of, uh, angle, I suppose. And then I think it goes to 55 degrees. And so the Nautilus is really nice and it, it, the pad moves uh, fairly low. And then also Atlantis. So Atlantis and Nautilus are the two brands that I like the most for the 45 degree. Um, and to, for, for my sake of saying why I prefer this over the hip thrust, I think it is easier to obviously set up, but I also think that it is more specific to the goal that is trying to be accomplished. If we're looking at the 45 degree hip extension and the hip thrust, both of these are trying to bias the fully hip extended or glute shortened position. And there's a lot of things that could go I don't want to say wrong, but could contribute to the action of moving that barbell and the hip thrust. Whereas with the 45, we can just be more isolated to the glutes and teach more to executing that more properly and then load as needed moving forward if, if it's necessary. Um, so I'd pick the 45 degree. I was surprised that the leg press did not find its way into tier two for you. You know, and maybe that's a mishap. I mean, like <laughs> maybe we move the kickback down to tier three, move the leg press up to tier two. Um, real quick on the 45 degree, what I've actually found is, again, if you have access to this, but if you were able to use like a flat, like flat metal plate and you put that uh, down below the foot pad, that's actually helped me whenever I try been traveling a lot. Um, that's been a little, little hack if the machine is just slightly too big. Um, but again, well executed, I think that's going to be far superior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I recommend like the, the step up plate or the top of the box that could work there if it fits in some of them, it fits. And then you could also do like 45 pound plates leaned up against the side that would also elevate the feet, which would be helpful. Um, all right. So we're through our first six exercises now that we've, we, I mean, six exercises should honestly be enough for you to grow great glutes over two training sessions in a week. And this may be blowing some of, uh, the listener's mind right now, but that truly is the case. Like that's six great exercises that you could apply into your training and be able to structure properly to have great results. Now we're getting into those are off the table. We have three exercises left to maximize overall hypertrophy for glutes. What comes to mind for you? We'll work together on this one. Yeah. Yeah. So assuming that we moved, um, a, a leg press or hip press into tier two, um, it's still going to go with the cable kickback into tier three. Um, a, I, I will put a hip thrust in there. I'll put a hip thrust in tier three because I, I do think that, um, it, I mean, personally, I, I do like it later in the workout. Um, but I, I do think there's, there's good rationale to have some degree of hip thrust, uh, within the programming, even though right now, I mean, like I'm, I'm doing significantly less volume. Um, I think with the focus of, you know, okay, I need uh, a majority of my lower body volume per week to be dedicated specifically to glutes. I think that fulfills that. Um, and then past that, I would say a machine abduction, mm. Or uh, yeah, machine abduction, cable abduction. Yeah, I could do that. And and I think that there's variants of all these exercises that we've already said that you could be like, if you're not going to categorize this as one option, then we could, you know, use some of the B stance or others as uh, opportunities there. But I would also probably add the step up to that if we didn't already say it. 
we've kind of talked about it, but I don't think it was in our list. So, uh, shoot, I wanted to I wanted to take a step back because I completely forgot about lunges. Oh completely. yeah, lunges. Would work and too. It went, which okay, so I think I I think I said dumbbell step up. Uh, uh, dumbbell step up. I guess we could move that to tier to tier three. So okay, redoing tier two. Uh, <laughs> we got the walking lunge, leg press, and uh, 40, 45 degree hip extension. Okay. So then tier three. Which one are we gonna? Oh fuck. Okay, I'm gonna get rid. I guess I'm gonna get rid of the hip thrust. Really strong <laughs> argument that I just dissolved right there. Um, <laughs> Amazing, beautiful. Uh, so we'll put the dumbbell step up tier three, which I would still even, I'd, I'd say let's put it in tier two, but just if we only get nine, right. I would say it's going to fall somewhere somewhere between the leg, uh, the glute bias leg press and a cable kickback somewhere in between there. Yeah. The upper end of tier three, maybe. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. It is crazy to realize that the hip thrust does not make our top 10 glute exercises. Oof. Oof, that is an Instagram clip right there. You know someone, we know who is going to come for us. Speaking <laughs> of that particular person, <laughs> um, the person that may be coming for us, his name is Brett Contreras. And I've heard him talk about <laughs> how he likes to utilize 36 total sets of glutes every week. That is what he has found Shut to up. be the best over three days. He has 12 sets of vertical hip extension, 12 sets of horizontal hip extension, and then 12 sets of hip abduction. Now I have a feeling that I know Sick. what your thoughts are, but could you share those with us? <laughs> you know what? Okay. You're going to be surprised because I know last time I was on here, I was like, it was very diplomatic. I was very diplomatic about my response to this. Um, it works. It works what he's doing. But I do think that there's context that's being missed. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these women he's working with, he he is personally training them. He is with them. And I would say like, objectively, if you have someone just designing a very long, uh, long workout, I mean, like that in itself, it's going to be more effective than if you are training by yourself. Um, I think that's an important aspect. A lot of the clients that he's working with, uh, also uh, their livelihood is based on them being able to display very well-developed glutes. Uh, there's a drug component to this, which like, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and say that, that like a lot of their livelihood is based off of this. Many of which, uh, IFBB bikini competitors, wellness competitors, could or could not be leveraging some kind of enhancements, which with enough of the right thing, it it will yield results. I, I don't want to lean too heavily into that side of the argument, but a lot of volume, it, it will work. It's just, there's considerations to be made around uh, generally, like, is this the most effective? It, it's effective, asterisk, but is it necessary? No, right. it's not. Um, the volume that I used to train at, I would say it did resemble that style of training. But there's a certain point where it becomes like, okay, am I just in the gym doing busy work? Am I just doing all of these sets to make up for a lack of quality or let's say more, more effective movements, which I think is oftentimes the case. Um, I, having 
been in the trenches of, you know, a very hefty contest prep and getting injured through that. I mean, like that is a priority of mine is ensuring that we're minimizing the risk of injury and not wasting time. Um, so yeah, if we're, we're doing, you know, several supersets, I think his whole workouts are supersets. Is that right? That, that may be true. I've, I mean, I've had a handful of clients who have come from the, um, the monthly, I think it's like an email that he sends out and he sends out the training. And then that's like a, you know, type of, of program design that he has more as a generalization. And those specific training phases certainly have a lot of supersets and very high repetition work as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, efficiency is everything to me. Um, and I, I want to ensure that like for clients who are really trying to understand, well, why are so many people getting results off of a program that, uh, goes against everything that we just laid out here? Mm -hmm. Um, shitload of volume, yeah. it's a shitload of volume. Um, and that's, that will get you it, there to a certain point. But I mean, like eventually you are going to hit a point where you're not seeing those same results. Like the outcome is not what you're hoping for. So what do you do? Do you just keep increasing volume? I mean, like what's the ceiling at which you're going to increase volume? Um, personally for me, like I, I think that needs to be considered um, for myself, for clients who are going to go in and out of a contest prep, because I, I do think like once you're injured, I mean, that's going to... Um, really put a stop to any progression you're going to make, um, in your competitive career, competitive, uh, aspirations, but also from a growth standpoint, I mean, I think there's a good argument to make if glute growth is the focus. Um, and in the case that you are in an intentional growth phase, maybe using enhancements, that's not the time I want someone to get injured. Right. That's the, that's the time we want to keep injury at the lowest, uh, yeah, we, we, we don't want to increase that risk. Absolutely. And you have a, like, you see the results that he's able to get with some of these clients. Now you have to also take into consideration, there is a large quantity of people who are performing the training. And so you take the percentages of like, this is how many people are doing it. If we can get one or two great results from this, then that's what the public is able to see. So you always want to keep those things in mind, but also on the flip side, you want to understand that if you were to perform that many sets, what level of intensity could you even fathom to do? I mean, it would be an RPE of four to six cap. There's no way that you would be able to do an RPE of eight or nine with any of those sets and still be able to accomplish a full training session that would include, um, at, at minimum 12 total, you know, hard working sets. Um, and so having that dispersed over a time frame, could it be done? Yes. And if that's how you enjoy training, and you want to be in the gym for that duration of time, then by all means, you go for it. But I would say that there are other ways to go about it, more efficient ways to go about it, and a better structure that is going to yield less possibility of injury, but also less uh, utilization of supporting tissue because the tissue that you're trying to train is so fatigued that it's not even really contributing anymore. It's like, hey, we've given all of our effort today. You can use everybody else and we're gonna, you, you can keep <laughs> moving through space, but we're going to use the adductor. We're going to use the quad. We're going to use everything that possibly could help here instead of us because we are so done and we cannot help you any longer. Like that is a real thing. It It is. I'm so glad you touched on that. Um, it, quality is going to severely diminish. And I mean, like, I got to think like if you're in the gym for that long, I mean, like, dude, like for me, like reps or sorry, working sets, once I'm at 15, I'm not feel like I'm like my glutes are done. Like they, they did their job today. And at that point I'm like, okay, like that, that was a, it was just over an hour, just I'm done me under 90 minute workout. Like I feel good. And again, like when, then when you look at like the training split too, like the number of days that we're doing glutes, um, uh, three lower days a week. I mean, like that's what I've been at for a while. That is hard to recover from if you're training at an RAR of one to two for every exercise. I don't think that I could train at that same intensity and work my, my sets up per lift. I mean, like, gosh, even shooting for like 16, 18, like that, 
it's not going to be favorable. We're going to start recruiting uh, the secondary muscles that, I mean, like in my case, like my adductors, I don't do direct adduct, uh, adductor work, um, but I have seen adductor growth. Like that is a result of doing some of these compound movements uh, just transiently. I'm, I'm going to stimulate them. I think in terms of like even the realm of bikini building, like that needs to be consideration. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I totally agree. And I think that we can kind of round out this portion of our conversation in having uh, some dialogue back and forth of how do we how do we create the total sets that we may be accomplishing over a week's time if someone's coming to us? I think that there's a lot of uh, nuance that we can have conversation on. And I think that the nuance ends up being very beneficial for everyone to hear because understanding the amount of considerations that go into creating a training protocol for a client or, or how we're structuring these things out is great to hear because there's just so much that really does go into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, where, where would you like to take it? I mean, like what, um, what key points of application do you think would be most beneficial for the listener? So I look at it in a way that if we can create the archetype for the, like of the client, I think that's probably the the best place. So if we look at it in a, a way that we have the client as a, uh, an NPC or amateur bikini competitor. She's been told by Sandy that she needs to bring up her upper outer glute. I would say that that is the number one feedback that I have from inquiring clients right now. I need to bring up my upper outer glute um, to get me to the next level for me to compete well on the national stage and get to be a pro. This client has had three to five years of hard resistance training hasn't really found a real program. She goes in and she is just training. I'm training glutes today and my glutes are recovered. I'm training glutes again. So I may train it three days a week. I may train it two days, some weeks. Um, but I haven't had a whole lot of education on the, the, how to perform the exercises or what have you. Um, but I'm needing to grow my glutes. How would you, uh, this person is now in a calorie surplus. They're out of the reverse hormonally. They're back into a efficient position. Everything is good there. Um, how would we go about maybe structuring her training? I love it. Okay. So if she's not, I'm, I'm assuming, um, if there is a discrepancy in glute mead that we're trying to correct, that's like our priority. Yes, we need more glute max, but predominantly we need the glute mead. Um, I'm going to say her programming needs to encompass a lot of unilateral work, specifically that contralaterally loaded setup. So that can be in the form of a B-stance RDL, landmine RDL, uh, the dumbbell step up, front foot elevated split squat. You can do rear foot elevated split squat if you can maintain that vertical shin angle. Perfect. Okay. Um, really honing in on their intensity. So, I mean, like for, as a coach, this is my client. I'm like, Hey, these are the movements that I want to see. Uh, I want to see the final reps of, um, I also want to know too, like, Hey, are you, are you taking, do you, do you go from your dominant or non-dominant leg into your dominant leg, like left to right? Are you taking a rest break in between that? It's a, God, it's, a, it's such a big pet peeve of mine. I'm like, Hey, clients, like we need them to grow at this, at the same rate. Um, and if you're just going from my, my left leg is my non-dominant. If you're just going from your left leg to then your right leg immediately with no rest break, the quality of that, uh, that second, second leg, I, I I don't think it's going to be as high as if you were to take, I mean, gosh, just set it up on your phone, set a timer, 30 seconds. Like that's all I'm asking for. 45 seconds, a minute, a oh, gold, golden client. Um, if we can do that, I'm very, very happy. Uh, I think three days a week is feasible, but I do encourage clients, like if you're finding that you're not able to train going into that next session, maybe, maybe there's an argument to take an additional rest day. Uh, maybe we do need to look, uh, generally at the program, like a global program. So, you know, their output, if they're, they're doing any kind of like systemically fatiguing cardio. So I, I personally, I like to do cardio on my rest days, but if you have a client who's doing, let's say Stairmaster prior to their second or third lower body day of the week. Okay, maybe we want to reconsider that. Um, if their step count is excessively high, we want to ensure that everything on the recovery front, that we're utilizing all of those tools, 
I think it's very possible that they can train glutes or they can train lower three days a week. Um, and even within that, maybe there are two days where that those are exceptionally effective workouts. Maybe that third day, maybe it's not as systemically fatiguing, but I'm still going to have that uh, unilateral movement that's contralaterally loaded included at several points. So all three days. Um, and in this case, where we're talking about a hinge versus a squat, I, I'm going to have uh, both of those in at multiple points. Yes. I love it. I, I'm and, and in accordance with you, the total amount of sets is going to be tough just to go off of the archetype that I created here because the one step that is so tremendously important in creating that amount is the video that Corey talked about of understanding, hey, send me a video of what an RIR of one looks like for you. And then that's really where you can dictate the amount of total sets that the person is is doing. And then the further thought that goes into it is what are the exercises that are being selected to make up those sets? If we have things that are going to be more systemically fatiguing, something like a front squat or a back squat, squat, we may have less total sets that we're performing. But if we're doing things maybe like a glute bridge or a hip thrust or kickback variations, we may have more total sets that are being performed. And so this you know, conversation is so beneficial, but also to take a, a big takeaway is that these arbitrary numbers of this is the amount of sets that you need to perform to achieve hypertrophy is not looking at the full picture because we have so much variability within the exercises that are selected, the training age of the particular client or person, um, as well as a myriad of other you know factors that go into this. And so we can have all these different conversations, but the reality is, is that there's just a lot of thought that goes into it. And to have one set way is probably not going to be the, the answer. Absolutely. And I, I think that's something um, from a for the listener who is really trying to further their own knowledge base around uh, training design uh, biomechanics, we really have to move away from specific to this avatar, the bikini competitor. We have to move away from someone who's like, we're going to cap out our weekly working sets at this point. I'm not saying there isn't a ceiling, but not all movements are created equally. And like Alex said, if this is something that you're going into that, let's say you're your lower B, um, and maybe you're not starting with a bilateral squat or an RDL. Okay. Well, may maybe we can get away with a little bit more volume that day, but that in itself, I mean, like these movements, yes, they might be glute biased. You're going to get some transient stimulus to the glute, uh, to the quads and hamstring. Um, th they're not, they're not 36 sets of glutes per week. I mean, like that's just not true. That's not at all what we're saying. Um, specifically with our more systemically fatiguing movements, our RDLs, our squats. If we're going for maximal loadability here, um, I think it's completely fine to have two quality working sets, um, like for the squat. Like I, I have a day where I'm just doing two working sets and like the focus there, yes, I am still at my, uh, my highest working weight, but I'm not going for 15 reps. I'm only doing two sets. Okay. So it's fatiguing. Yes but still manageable. And I think being able to establish what overbidding would look like um, in terms of recovery, does doing four sets at a higher working weight, uh, sets of 12 to 15 for a squat, does that make it to where the rest of your movements are negatively impacted to a point where you, you can't recover even within the workout? Then maybe we need to address that design. I love that. And, and I think that that's a really key point to bring up of don't be afraid to only do two working sets of a particular exercise. Because I would say in the grand scheme of things, a lot of people are afraid to go below three sets. It's just uncommon in a lot of programs that would be bought. Um, as a one-off of some sort that, you know, three is kind of the base and then it goes even, you know, high as 10 for some programs that some people create. So, um, all really awesome information. This was such a, a great conversation with you, Corey. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, is there anything that you would leave the listener with pertaining to glute training? That's like, if you only get one thing from today's episode, this is what I want you to have. Um, gosh, so many things. Um, RIR, it, that is going to change um, depending on how recovered you are. And just because you are not using the same load, so the weight, um, 
workout to workout, it doesn't mean you still aren't capable of hitting an RAR of one to two. And I think uh, developing that skill, I think it's going to be invaluable and it's going to allow you to get more out of your training, which for the female athlete, I, I think is key. I couldn't agree more. Um, Could you give everyone where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Instagram, Corey, C-O-R-Y underscore fit, F-I-T. YouTube, Patreon, uh, TikTok, (laughs) all of them. Corey (laughs) underscore fit. Um, I too offer one-on-one coaching. That can be for competitors. That can be for Uh, non-competitors. Whatever phase you're in, I can help. I do offer one-time consultations. That can be something if you already have a coach and they're like, Hey, I'm good. I'm happy with my coach. But you're like, they don't really do the lab work. They don't really do the PED thing. Um, hit me up, check out, um, check out the services in that regard. Uh, bring your coach. That's something that happens more often than you would think. If it's something that you, um, have a need for, um, don't feel like you need to be locked into a coaching contract with me. Um, It's on an as-needs basis. I do offer exclusive uh, educational content on Patreon in two separate tiers. So tier one, tier two. Um, If you're interested in furthering your education, whether you are an athlete or a coach, a weekly podcast come out on YouTube, self-selecting podcast. Um, Tune in for more information. This is perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you guys for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.